there, right? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa mursaleen. Nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma infa'na bima alimtana wa alimna ma yanfa'una. Allahumma zidna ilman innaka anta alimul hakeem. Allahumma ij'al hadihi al-muhadara hujjatan lana la hujjatan alayna ya rabbil alameen amma ba'd. Uh, this is our 12th class. This is our 12th class. And uh, Zara Mustaqni' Lil Imam Al Hajjawi Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Right now, we're going to start Bab Nawaqid al Wudu, the chapter that deals with the nullifiers of Wudu. There are many, there are many things that are used, many things that uh, are known to nullify a person's Wudu. So we're going to start, uh, the Shaykh Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he starts in the Metin of Zad al-Mustaqni'ah. The first thing he mentions is, يَنْقُضُ مَا خَرَجَ مِنْ سَبِيلٍ يَنْقُضُ مَا خَرَجَ مِنْ سَبِيلٍ So then there are lists, before we get started, there are eight things. There are eight things in general, and from those eight things there are other subcategories of things that are known to break a person's wudu. So we're going to talk about them in a little bit of detail, inshallah ta'ala. So number one, the first thing, يَنْقُضُ مَا خَرَجَ مِنْ سَبِيلٍ Anything that comes from سَبِيلٍ, a pathway. Like, what is considered a pathway? We have, as uh, humans, right, we have two pathways to release human waste. Either through, uh, you, you know, uh, the male private parts, if you will, or through the anus, right? We have two ways to release uh, waste, okay? Anything that comes from those two areas, those are considered the sibil, yani the pathway. Anything that comes from those two areas are known to break a person's wudu. Are known to break a person's wudu. Like, as it relates to a person, a man, uh, a male has a private part, right? There are four types of fluids that come out. All of them, and this is, this is, yeah, I mean, this is our deen. There's no shyness in a religion, and these issues, we all, you know, we, we're human, we live. So if nobody's going to talk about it, then you never know. You'll never know. Um, so then, there are four types of fluid that comes from a male's private part, and they all have names. Uh, so the first one is called uh, bowl. Does anyone know what bowl is? Bowl, huh? Not a bowl that we eat. This is in Arabic. We eat it, huh? Urine. Ahsent. So then the first thing that is known to break a person's wudu. All of them break your wudu. However, three of them require wudu and the other one requires a ghusl. Okay. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about that when we get into the chapter of al ghusl So from the things that comes out of a male's private part is something called al-madhi. Al-madhi. Al-madhi is something that comes out if a person is, uh, is aroused. If a male is aroused, right, it may come out before sperm is released, a type of fluid that comes prior to sperm. This is called al-madhi. Um, and just to show that al madhi yanqud yanqud al wudu ijma there's a the scholarly consensus that this fluid is known to break the wudu lamma ruwi ali ali radiyallahu ali ibn abi talib radiyallahu ta'ala anhu who was the cousin of the prophet alayhi salatu wassalam he married the daughter of the prophet alayhi salatu wassalam right so he had a problem, he had an issue. And so he said, So Ali ibn Abi Talib, he was shy. He had this issue or this problem, but he was shy to say something to the Prophet as he said he was a man 
He was a man that this happened to all the time. فَأَسْتَحْيَيْتُ أَنْ أَسْأَلَ And he said, I was shy to ask the Prophet ﷺ because I'm married to his daughter. I mean, I don't, you know, what does that look like? He talking to him about his daughter, the issue that I'm having. So he sent someone else. He sent Miqdad ibn Aws to ask the Prophet, or Ibn Aswad. He sent some to ask the Prophet ﷺ about this issue. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, يَقْسِلُ ذَكَرَهُ وَأُنْتَيَيْهِ وَيَتَوَضَّ رَوَهُ أَبُو دَعُودِ he said, wash your penis and your testicles. Okay? He told him to wash them both and then make wudu. Wash them both and then make wudu. And there's also another narration, وَفِرِوَايَةٍ تَوَضَّعَ وَنْضَحْ فَرُجَكِ And then another narration, he said, make wudu and wash your private area. Make wudu and wash your private area. And this hadith was reported in Muslim. So then, that's the issue of al-madi. There's another fluid. It's called al-wadyu. Al-wadyu is sometimes it comes after urination. It might be white fluid that may come after urination. From this, it says, ma'un abiyat yakhruj aqib al-bawl. Laysa fi baqiyat al-kharij. Illa al-wudu. This is another type of fluid that comes out. This type of fluid, it generally comes after a person urinates. After a person urinates, it may come, may not come. But it, if it does come, then he said, is ma'un abyad. This is the, the scholars of the past talk about this stuff. This is not something that's uh, new. This is stuff that was discussed over, thousands, over a thousand years ago. And so they say that there's a type of fluid that is white, that comes out after a person urinates. And then, uh, so that's three. We mentioned three, right? And then the last one is sperm. This fluid here, it requires a ghusl. It requires a ghusl. And if the person knows the distinction between the, the four of them, is that sperm comes out with a thrust. This is the way the ulama of al-Islam explain it. And we'll talk about this in more detail as we get into the chapter of uh, ghusl, inshallah ta'ala. Bye. So the Shaykh Rahimahullah, he says, وَخَارِجْ مِنْ بَقِيَةِ الْبَدَنِ إِنْ كَانَ بَوْلًا أَوْ غَائِدًا وَكَثِيرٌ نَجِسٌ غَيْرَهُمَا And he also says, anything that is najis that comes out of any other part of the body. So a person may ask, and he says, إِنْ كَانَ بَوْلًا Is it possible that urine can come out of a person's body besides their private parts? Yes. If a person's sick, or maybe he has an injury, they may have bags. A person may have a bag, and inside the bag it may be urine or feces that goes inside of it. Okay? This here is also considered najis, and it breaks the wudu. Uh, and like, oh, kathira najis and ghayrahuma. Another type of najis may come out as well, other than urine and feces that may come out of other parts of the body. And so some of the ulama, they mention here, al wa dam blood, a lot of blood, a lot of blood is considered najis. And likewise, throw up is also considered najis. And this is due to the hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, his hadith, rawahu al-tirmidhi, when he says, innahu sallallahu alayhi wa sallama qa'a fatawadda'a. And Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, he threw up and then he made wudu. And this was the position of many of the companions. They also, I'm not saying this is one-sided position because there's some ulama that say this is not correct. However, the ones that do, from them we find Ibn Abbas, wa Ibn Umar, wa Sa'id ibn Musayyib, wa A'ta, wa Katada, wa Sufyan al-Thawri, rahimahumallahu ta'ala. This is the position that many of them held. That, the next issue, so, so thus far we mentioned things that come out of the private parts, right? Then we have things that come out from other than those private parts. Then we have something called zawal al-aqil, or al-aqil, zawal al-aqil, illa yasira nawmin qa'idin wa qa'iman. So the next issue, 
that we'll discuss is a person's uh, intellect is being removed. A person's intellect is removed on one way or the other. So they mention many of the scholars of Al-Islam, when they mention the issues of intellect being removed or a person loses intellect, they mention some very specific ex examples. So the first one is a gnome sleeping. And we're going to talk about sleeping in detail in a minute. The first one is sleeping. The next one is junoon. Junoon, what is junoon? Junoon is when a person uh, loses their intellect for perhaps maybe they, they become mentally challenged. They lose their faculties, right? Um, another one is al-igma. Al-igma is when a person becomes unconscious. They pass out. This also breaks a person's wudu. And another thing that's mentioned here is a sukur. If a person, if a person is drunk, a person is high, or their intellect is altered in some way, okay? This here is also a form of a person losing their intellect. With regards to sleeping, so many of the scholars of Al-Islam, they say, They say that sleep, it breaks down into three categories. Sleeping, it breaks down into how many categories? Three categories. So from those categories is the type of sleeping where a person lays down. Everyone's familiar with that. So it says, So, so many of the scholars of Al-Islam, they say that this type of sleeping, laying down on your side, whether you're laying down, sleeping for a small amount of time or a long amount of time, uh, it breaks the wudu. This is a position. This is a position. All right? And so from the people that held this position, there are many who held this position, but there are some who also did not hold this position. And so from them who did not hold this position, was Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Have any of you guys ever heard of Sa'id ibn Musayyib and who, who he was? Does anyone know? Sa'id ibn Musayyib. Who is he? Hmm? Never heard of him. Never heard of him a day in your life. You heard of him. You don't know anything about him. <clears throat> Sa'id ibn Musayyib, he was from the Tabi'i. What's the tabi? Does anyone know? After the campaigns. After the campaigns. Or at the same time with the campaigns. So are they campaigns? What is the tabi anyway? So they're campaigns that are campaigns? So what's the difference between a tabi and a campaign? They never met the Muhammad Sent. They never met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib was from the Tabi'i. And as they would say about him, Alim al ahlu Medina. He was from the ulama of Medina. And we have something in Islam. It's very, the more you study it, Islam will come across different issues. They have something called the Fuqaha as saba Something called the seven scholars, if you will. The seven Islamic jurists. Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions in his book, and what this means basically is like you're signing off on what Allah, this is what this title is, this is a tremendous title. In any event, he mentions in his book, he says, Can al Muftuna bil Medina mana tabi'in? He said, There were people, scholars in Medina, that would give fatawa. And there were seven. Actually, the number is more than seven, but he mentions a list of them. And from these ulama, they were all ulama that would give fatawa. And so from them was Sa'id ibn Musayyib. And then it was Urwa ibn Zubair, wa Qasib ibn Muhammad, wa Kharija ibn Zayd, wa Salih ibn Abdullah, wa Adan ibn Uthman, wa Abu Salama. And there were, there were more than that. Um, this is something, inshallah ta'ala, as we continue, perhaps we'll get into some of the biographies of these people. So you know a little bit more about them and who they were, how they lived, etc. Right. So, what I'm about to tell you about Ibn, uh, Sa'id ibn Musayyib is that he knew this position that if a person laid down on their side, that it, that, that it would break your wudu. However, he didn't take that position. 
Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, he didn't take that position. So he said, أَنَّهُ كَانَ يَنَامُ مِرَارًا مُدَّجِعًا يَنْتَدِرُ الصَّلَاةِ ثُمَّ يُسَلِّي وَيَعْبُدْ وَلَا يُعِيدُ الْوُضُوءِ So he says, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, he knew that some people took that position, but he didn't take that position. Rather, he would sleep. He would lay down and sleep. Mudajan. He would lay down on his side uh, and waiting for the salat and fall asleep. Thuma yusalli. Then he will wake up, pray. Wala yuridu wudu. He will wake up and pray and do not um, do the wudu again. So the reason why I mentioned this because I want you to hear how the scholars of Al-Islam in the past, how they dealt with people who differ with them. How they dealt with them. What did they think about that? Sayyid ibn Musayyib was from the ulama, kibar, from the major scholars of the Salaf. But he took a position. So what did some of the ulama that came at? What did they say about that? Did they say, oh, he's not on it? Did they say he's this? Did they talk about him? Did they say we're not going to sit in this class? Did, did, what did they say about him? So what they did was they came up with excuses. That's what the ulama did. They come up with excuses. So they said, لَعَلَّهُمْ ذَهَبُوا إِلَىٰ أَنَّ النَّوْمَ لَيْسَ بِحَدَثٍ فِي نَفْسِهِ He said, perhaps he went with the position that sleeping doesn't actually break your wudu. Perhaps he believes that sleeping doesn't break your wudu. And then they came up with another excuse. They said, مَشْكُوكٌ فِي فَلَا يُزُولُ عَنِ الْيَقِينِ بِالشَّكِ They said, maybe he figured that if you sleep, you don't know for sure whether you broke your wudu or not. And then there's a principle in Islam that certainty is not removed with doubt. So therefore, he probably did it based on that. Look at that. They look for excuses. That's what the ulama do. So then the next, the next type or the second type of sleep is called nom al qaid. A person sleeps while they are sitting. A person sleeps while they are sitting up, like qaid, sitting down in a chair like this. So they said if a person does this, a, a strong form of sleeping, this breaks the wudu. And if it's a small amount of sleep, then it doesn't break your wudu. Why the cold? And who holds that position? This is the position of Imam Malik, wa Sufyan, a Thori, wa kana kaumun matta khalid al nom. And there are some of them that say once a person sleeps and they say the sleep actually affects his heart. What does that mean, affects your heart? Allah wow. But what it appears is that if a person is overcome by sleep, and Allah knows best, they say this type of sleeping, this type of sleeping uh, breaks a person's wudu in any situation. And this is the position. And the reason why I'm mentioning this some of these issues, I'm going to give you a little more detail, and the others, we're going to move by. And I think it's important um, when we're studying in fiqh to understand who from the past held these positions. This stuff is just made up? No. There are early madas, great scholars of Islam that held these positions. Well, who are they? And so it says, from those who held this position, كان حسن al-Basri, rahimahullah, is Hakim al-Rahui, who was a companion of Imam Ahmed. He also held this position, Wabu Ubaid, Wa Ma'na Dalik, and some of them held the meaning of this was Abu Huraira, Wa Ibn Abbas, Wa Anas, Wa Ibn Mundir. So we have many people that held this position. The position of what? A small amount of sleeping breaks your wudu. A small amount of sleeping breaks your wudu. Right. And this is due to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. روى إمام مسلم عن أنس قال كان أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ينامون ثم يصلون ولا يتوضعون وعنه كان أصحاب رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على أحد رسول الله ينتظرون الإشاء الآخر. They will wait for the second إشاء حتى تخفق رؤوسهم ثم يصلون ولا يتوضعون. Basically, talking about the ones that were sleeping, but they were. Sitting up, like sitting up, sleeping, maybe dying, dodging their heads, or dod their heads were nodding. So it says this hadith was reported on Ennis. And he said that the Messenger of Allah, or the companions of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were sleeping, 
And then they would pray. And they would not make wudu. They would not make wudu. And then in another narration, they were sleeping and their heads were nodding back and forth. And they would get up and pray and not make wudu. This sleeping here, as the ulama explained, this is the type of sleeping that they were sitting up. They were sitting, sleeping, not laying down. They were sitting up, sleeping, and they said that they were waiting for al-isha al-akhira. Al-isha al-akhira. This is the isha, salat al-isha. Salat al-maghrib and salat al-isha, they're called isha ain. They're called the two ishas. If you ever hear anyone say isha al-akhir, the last isha, they're talking about salat al-isha. And if you hear the two ishas, they're talking about maghrib and isha. And this is if you happen to read any of the books uh, from the past, and you read narrations when they talk about two different Isha's, this is what they're talking about. The first Isha is Maghrib, and the second one is Isha, Salatul Isha. Al Muhim, this is the position with regards to sleeping, sleeping, and a person is sitting up. Then there's a third, there's a third type of sleeping. Ma'adadalik. Any type of sleeping. Any type of sleeping other than laying down on your side, and any type of sleeping other than sitting up. It says this is this type of sleep can like what? Noom al qa'im. If a person is asleep while they're standing. Warraqir. If a person is in rukur and they fall asleep. Or a person is in sujood and falls to sleep. Or a person is sajid, sajidin and falls to sleep. What is the ruling on these people? Uh, they have two different positions with regards to that. Some say that it breaks your wudu, and some say that it doesn't. Uh, and Allah Ta'ala, and Allah knows best. There's a lot more detail with it that, you know, inshallah Ta'ala, we're not going to get into. The next thing, as we move on, the fourth thing that breaks a person's wudu is masu dhakarin mutasilin. All right, this here, this issue here, is talking about a person. It breaks a person's wudu if they touch their private parts. If a man touches his private part, it breaks his wudu. So my answer, ooh, if, what is hand? They mention here, mutasilan. If a man touches a private part that is connected to him or connected. So the early man say this, and they get very, is a lot of detail with these issues. They say, well, what if a person has a private part, a man has a private part that's been cut? And the piece that's cut off, if a person touches that, does that break the wudu as well? And they say, la. They say, rather, it has to be all connected. If it's connected and a man touches it or someone touches it, and then it breaks, it breaks the wudu. Uh, likewise for a woman, if a man touches or anyone touches a woman's private area, it also breaks the wudu. Be dhahari kafihi. When they say dhahari kaf, they're talking about the inside, palms. Or baltanihi. Dhahari kaf, I'm sorry. Baltanihi kaf is the back of the hand, while baltanihi is inside the palm. If a person touches uh, a private part based on that, then it breaks your wudu. So, We're going to mention some two hadith here, two hadith. And the purpose of mentioning these two hadith is so that we can understand how the ulama of al-Islam come up with issues. Where do they get this stuff from? Is it, you know, does it, does it make sense to you? How do they come up with this? So we found there are two positions with regards to touching a private part. Okay, there are two positions. Especially when it, when it comes to a man, there are two positions here. And we're going to read them, the two hadith, uh, how the ulama explain them, and how we could look at them and benefit from how the ulama think and how they look at these issues. So, number one, Rawa Qais ibn Talq. Qais ibn Talq is a tabi'i, mashhur. He was a known tabi'i. He said, An Abihi, there's a narration that he reported from his father, who was a companion. Qala, Kuntu Jalisin in the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fakala Rajulun. He said, His father said, I was sitting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fakala Rajulun. So a man said to the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Salam, Masastu Zakari. 
Or he said, A rajulu yamusu dakarahu fi salatin alayhi wudu. So a man said to the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, I touched my private part. Then he said, Or the man said, He touched his private part while he was in salat. Does he have to make wudu? So the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, قال لا. He said, No. إنما هو بدع إنما هو بدع 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 منك. He said, No. For indeed, is a is a part of your body. And this hadith was reported by Imam Ahmed, wa Imam Tirmidhi, wa Imam Al Nasai, wa li innu adhu minhu. فلم ينقض كسائر كسائر أعضائه. They say, No. This is because it's a part of his body. And it doesn't break his wudu just like any other part of his body. So they say, La yanqut bihalim. They say, in fact, it doesn't break your wudu, period, based on this hadith. And they said, Well, how the men and whoever the people who held this position was Ali ibn Abi Talib, wa Ammar, he's also from the Sahaba, wa Ibn Mas'ud, wa Hudayf, wa Imran ibn Hussein. Wabi Darda, wa Kaur Rabi'a, wa Sufyan Thori, wa Ibn Mundir. These are many people who held this position. So then, so far, right now, when it comes to touching a private part, we have a hadith that clearly says what? That the Prophet, what did the Prophet say? He said, it doesn't break your wudu, right? Hadith is authentic. Okay? So then the person might say, well, how do we have a difference of opinion? Hadith is clear. So, right? Everybody's quiet. I'm the only one talking? Huh? It's clear. It's clear. What's clear? That is... <laughs> Shake when? What's clear? Touching the private part? What, what about touching the private part? Whether it's the time of prayer or not. Huh? Because it doesn't break your wudu because of part of your body based on this hadith. And there are a number of companions that held that position. Sah? So? All right. Wait. Then we have another hadith. And one of the benefits about our religion is we take our religion from the Quran, the Sunnah, and understand that the pious predecessors. Right? And we use a hadith, we look at a hadith, we look at verses in the Quran, we look at ijma'at, consensus among the scholars, so on and so forth. So there's another hadith. This hadith, Rawat, it was reported on Busra bint Safwan. This is a Sahabiyat. A Sahabiyat woman, okay? She said, and the Rasulullah, she reported this hadith. And the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam She said, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, Men masa dhakarahu fal yatawadda. She said, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, whoever touches their private part, then he has to make wudu. This is what she said. Huh? Wa'an jabir mithla dalik. And there's another narration that jabir also said the same thing. وَرَوَاهُمَا إِبْنُ مَاجِنَ You can find both of them in Ibn, Ibn Majin. وَقَالَ إِمَامَ التِّرْمِذِي He said, حَدِيثٌ بُسْرَ حَسَنٌ صَحِيحٌ uh, Imam al-Tirmidhi said, this hadith is authentic. قَالَ إِمَامَ الْبُخَارِ أَصَحُ شَيْءٍ مِنْ هَذَا الْبَادِ Imam al-Bukhari, he said that this is the, the strongest hadith in this whole issue. The Hadith of Busra. The Hadith of Busra is the strongest Hadith dealing with this whole issue. Was Sahahu Imam Ahmed, and likewise Imam Ahmed authenticated this Hadith. Now we have an issue. Right or wrong? I just mentioned it. She said, "The Prophet wasalam, said, whoever touches their private part, they have to make wudu." That's it. So we have another Hadith of Talq. Qais ibn Talq. He says what? The man said, I touched my private part, and he was, he said he had to make wudu. Or he said, no, he said it was a piece of his body. It's okay, it's like nothing. Then another hadith, we have something that's totally opposite. Are they opposites or no? Uh, now we have an issue. 
Whoever is listening or watching, ah, we found a mistake in Islam. It goes against each other. Sa? Huh? No. So how do we fix that problem? Do they sound like they go against each other? Yes or no? Just be honest. Don't, don't. It do. Huh? They go against each other. Okay, I sent. I sent. So then both of these hadith are authentic. So how do we understand this? So the scholars of usul, usul of fiqh, the fuqaha of al-Islam, their job, what do they do? They're scientists. This is their specialty. They look at a hadith, they bring them in and they examine them. Let's look at it. They both found that they're both authentic. So what did they say? They said, فَأَمَّا حَدِيثُ قَيْسِ That's for the first hadith. قَيْسِ بْنِ طَلْقِ He says, فَقَالَ أَبُو زُرْعَ أَبُو زُرْعَ وَأَبُو حَاتِمْ They're both uh, imitah hadith. They said, قَيْسِ مِنْ مَا لَا تَقُومُ بِرِوَايَتِهِ حُجَّةِ They said that قَيْسِ We don't use this hadith as a proof. They don't use this statement as a proof in hadith. Abu Zur'a and Abu Hatim. Does that mean everyone else took his position? La. Which statement? The statement that the hadith of, of Qais ibn Talq. Okay? Abu Zur'a and who else? Abu Hatim. They said, we don't use him as a proof. We don't use his hadith as a hujjah. He's not a proof in his statement. Did they force everyone else to take their position? Nah. They don't do that. Yeah, but that's kind of like, it's kind of... Oh, let me finish. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Let me finish. They don't force, they didn't force her just because they didn't see them to be, him to be strong in this narration of this hadith. Did that mean everyone had to take the same position? No. So then, ثُمَّ حَدِيثَ بُسْرَ مُتَأَخِرَ So then the ulama also mentioned that the hadith of Busra, which is the hadith of Busra, whoever touches their private part, they have to make wudu. They said, this hadith came later. The other hadith was earlier in Islam. And this is why, why is this? They say, listen, listen how they, look at how they looked at the narrations. They said, This is that this is because Abu Huraira was the one that narrated the hadith of Busra. He was in that chain. And he came to Islam late. Whereas the other hadith was earlier in Islam. So then, they, the ulama, they look at this hadith and they say that one of the hadith abrogates the other one. And the other one is mansukh. What does that mean? The hadith of Qais ibn Talq is abrogated. In other words, in the beginning of the hadith, where they mention that if a person touches their private parts, it's just a part of your body. This is in the earlier part of Islam. But towards the end of this, when we say towards the end, yeah, and this means closer to the death of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. Towards the end, this is when this other hadith was reported by Busra bint Safwan. By Busra bint Safwan. She said, the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, whoever touches their private part, they have to make wudu. And so based on that, this is uh, the position that many of the ulama use is that if you touch your private part, it breaks your wudu. And from them who hold that position, it's Imam Ahmed, wa Ibn Umar, wa Sa'id ibn Musayyib, as you mentioned about him, wa A'ta, wa Urwa, wa Sulaiman, ibn Yasir, wa Zuhri, wa Awza'i, wa Imam al Shafi'i. And it's something that's also famous from the school of thought of Imam Malik. The purpose of mentioning this is to show you guys that everything in the deen is not black and white. We don't, we don't find any of the salaf forcing everyone to take another position that one of the salaf held. And if you have that, hey, hat, bring your evidence. Our religion is a religion that's based upon proofs and evidences. It's no, it's no place for a person to put their desires in there and try to force you or him to follow the position of this person or follow the position of that person. And they all had evidence. All of them had what? Evidence. Now, Father, you had a question, Sheikh. I'm saying that's kind of like cool. Like when you say when you were saying that the um, scholars say what we don't we don't we don't use that. What time was that like like occurring? Like you know you know what I'm saying like, how was the someone died? Okay, you, you said we got the tap in. And when did it occur for them to, to even have to be on that type of time? Like, man, listen, uh, we, we gonna, we gonna, we gonna, we gonna, after the death of the Prophet, that's when everybody guards one up. 
They said when the fitna came, we used to ask some Mary Jalakun, name your men. Where'd you hear that from? I heard it from him. Huh? Uh, no. Name your men. That's deep, yo. Name your men. And one of the beauty, one of the beautiful things about our religion is that we can trace stuff back. We, you know, unfortunately, we've gotten recently we we've gotten into the mentality of just following everyone, what everyone says. We don't ask for the little. At one point in time in this city, in this city here, when it came years ago, everything was about the little. What you got? What's your the little for that? We was hadith right here, and this is what this hadith says. Allah says this. Unfortunately, you know, we're not at that time anymore. But inshallah ta'ala, the more we hear stuff like this, inshallah we'll return back to that. We'll return back to that. Somebody commented and said this, I'm drinking with my left hand, but tell them this is really my right hand with the cameras uh, switched up. <laughs> this is one of the problems with this, right? Tayyip, Labats, Kola Thalit. And the third position here, وَلَا يَنْقُدْ إِلَّا أَنْ يَقْصِدَ مَسَّهُ فِي كَلَامِ كَثِيرٍ مَنْ ذَكَرَ مَسَّ ذَكَرَهُ فَخِذَهُ So some of them, the third position is, they say that if a person touches their private part by accident, then it doesn't break your wudu. And then they mention in an example, what if a person, what if their private part touches their thigh? Does that break your wudu too? Huh? <laughs> one of the benefits that we got uh, from one of, one of our Mashai, Sheikh Abdul Majid al Subayyan, he said, Al Afdalu Kama Alamna. Is the best thing, like what we were taught, is khuruj min al khilaf awla. Staying away from the differences of opinion is better. So if there's a difference of opinion on touching your private parts, because the urdu medic clearly different, then there's no khilaf. There's if you touch your private part, you make you will do. There's no difference of opinion. If you touch your uh, private part, you make will do. I don't know of any khilaf in that. Wassalam, rahmatullahi wa Does that make sense? Tayyip. So then the next issue. Tayyip. So then. Walamsuhuma hatta khunthi al khuntha mushkil. All right, now we get into a whole other issue here. So we have something, the scholars of the past, they talk about something called, we have people that are born every day that have, some people have conditions with them, right? How many of you are familiar with hermaphrodites? Have you ever heard this before? All right. So a hermaphrodite, um, as I did some research on it, nowadays it's considered a, a, a slur, if you will. Uh, you know, a, a name that's not really, you know, a person may be offended by hearing something like that. So, there's another term that's used. It's called intersexual. Are you guys familiar with that term? Intersexual. You've never heard of it. Right. Intersexual is the politically correct term. It's not offensive. Whereas, if you call someone a hermaphrodite, that may be offensive to them. So, the question is, what is a hermaphrodite? Hermaphrodites are individuals who possess ambiguous sexual organs. In other words, you may have a person that is a man, but he also has um, he has private parts of a woman as well as a man together. Or you may have a, a woman. She has the private parts of a man and a woman together. Um, so I read, I read about it somewhat because it talks about this in Islam. It's very... You know, these issues were discussed thousands of uh, thousand years ago, thousand, a th over a thousand years ago. So according to the Intersex Society of North America, they, did a, they conducted a research from 1993 up until 2008. They said one in 2,000 people have this condition. In other words, 1.05% uh, of the population in the U.S. suffer or have this condition. 
It said, according to the United States affiliate of the organization Intersex International, they say 1.7% of the population worldwide has this condition. And they said it's as common as if a person that has red hair. It's as common as you see a person has red hair. That's the, the, the free or the, you know, the, the common number of people that, has, that have this condition. So then Islam doesn't leave these people who have these conditions out. It talks about all of this. And so from them, it says, وَلَمْسَهُمَا مِنْ خُنْثٍ مُشْكِلٍ If a person were to touch uh, the private parts of a khunthi mushkil, in Arabic it's called the khunthi mushkil, yani a person that is a, a intersexual, if a person were to touch both of their private parts together at the same time, then it also breaks their wudu. It breaks their wudu. Walamsu dhakari dhakarahu. And so now it says, if a man touches, and, and the purpose of mentioning this here is to clarify ahkam. A man should never touch another man's private part. But if it were to happen, even this is clearly haram. This is clearly haram in Islam, but the fuqaha, they talk about it. Well, if this were to happen, then what? What is the ruling if it were to happen? So if a man were to do this, They said, if one, if a person were to touch, if a man were to touch uh, the male part of a khunthi, mushkil, um, or a female or woman were to touch the private part of another woman who was also a hermaphrodite or kunthi mushkil or intersexual, li shahwatin, with desire, uh, then this also breaks the wudu. This also breaks the wudu. So some of them mentioned. With regards to this, there are two. If a person touches, they have something called al-asli and the ghayr al-asli. They have the, the part that is considered the original organ and the part that is considered the extra piece. The, how would you know what the difference is? They say the original organ is the one that you actually use, that actually works, whereas the other one may not work. So the other one is not considered the, the original organ, if you will. If a man were to touch his wife with desires, then this also breaks their will do. And this reminds me of the first time I made Hajj, I think it was in 2003 or four. Um, we were with a group of brothers some of them followed the fit of Imam al-Shafi'i. So we're making tawaf around the Kaaba, and there were women that were walking next to us, and I think his hand touched her hand by mistake, and it was crowded. If any of you ever made hajj, you know, it's so crowded that you can't even see in front of you. So we're making tawaf, and his hand accidentally touched her hand. And he said, oh, no, I have to make wudu. And I thought he was joking, and he like made his way all the way out of the crowd to go make wudu and to come back and start his tawaf all over again. And I, I couldn't believe it, but this was a position that he followed. Whereas here when they say bishahwatan, if a person touches someone, this is according to the fiqh of Imam Ahmed, if a person touches a woman that he is not mahram to or whatever, and he touches her by mistake, not bad, if it's an accident. But if it's bishahwatan, if it's with desire, then this breaks the wudu. So someone's going to say, whoa, brother, hope I have a hadith of the Prophet والسلام, kissing Aisha ta'ala anha, and then leaving out for the salah, then break his wudu. Huh? Shahwatan here, some of the scholars mean with the intent of having, being intimate. It's a different type of touching with the intent to be intimate as the type of touching that is not to that level. And Allah knows, Allah knows best. Fight. 
Likewise, if a woman touches her husband in that way, uh, a way of desirable way for that purpose, then it also breaks the wudu. وَمَسُّ حَلْقَةٍ ذَبْدُبُرٍ وَلَا مَسَّ شَعْرٍ وَذُحْرٍ وَأَمْرَدٍ طيب. So then the next issue here is if a person touches the anus, if you will. The hold on the anus. If a person touches that, it also breaks the wudu. That also breaks the wudu. However, if a person touches their hair, nails, or so on and so forth, then it doesn't break your wudu at all. Then they mention something, the amrad. The fact that they mention amrad here, it also shows that there was a condition in the past of pedophilia. Al amrad here is a young child. During the time in the past, they had people who suffered from pedophilia. This is not something that's new. Rather, this happened in the past. So the early man spoke about that. They said, because sometimes you had men who would touch little boys. It doesn't mean that they're not Muslim, even though they had these conditions. They had these sick, some of them had these sick conditions with them, but it didn't mean they weren't Muslim. So even when you hear things like this, there are still rulings pertaining to that. It doesn't take them outside of Islam, even though they fell into these sins, but they still have to pray. They still have other things that are obligatory upon them. So they said, if they touch Amradin, uh, Amrat here is a young boy. Then it didn't break their wudu. It didn't break. Even though it's haram, just make sure we're clear on this. It's haram, pedophilia is haram in Islam. This is some, something that Muslims don't do. But if you found a Muslim that had this condition, it's a sickness. If you had a Muslim that had this condition, then this is the case. And it says, وَلَا مَا حَائِلًا وَلَا مَلْمُوسْ بَدْنَا So if a person... Or to touch a woman, all right, his, his spouse or whatever, with a ha'il. A ha'il is a cover, something that covers, like something that covers their hand, his or her hand while he's touching his wife. Then this here doesn't break the wudu. Wala mel mus. And likewise, if a man touches his wife with desires, however, he touches her, right, it breaks his wudu, but does it break her wudu as well? Does it break her wudu as well? So, Imam Ahmed, they have two positions. One position that doesn't break her wudu, and then another position, obviously, that it breaks her wudu, and Allah knows best. But, وَيَنْقُدْ غُسْلُ الْمَيِّتِ If a person is washing a dead body, a dead Muslim, or non-Muslim, if a person is washing the body, the one who actually touches the deceased, this also breaks their wudu. This is also considered something that breaks their wudu. And another thing here that breaks your wudu, aklu lahm khasa min al-jazur, eating camel meat. Eating camel meat also is known to break a person's wudu. If a person eats camel meat, it's also known to break their wudu. Wa kullu ma awjaba ghuslan, awjaba wudu an illa mawt. And anything that necessitates a person to make a ghusl, it also covers for them making wudu. Anything that you have to make a ghusl for, it also includes what's underneath that, which is wudu. So we're almost finished here. Uh, this last part here. وَمَنْ تَيَقَّنَ الطَّهَارَةَ وَالشَّكَّ فِي الْحَدَثِ أَوْ بِالْعَكْسِ بَنَا عَلَى الْيَقِينِ If a person, if you remember, maybe about a month ago, uh, we, we, we spoke about a legal maxim called al yakin la yazulu bishak does anyone remember that certainty is not removed with doubt does anyone remember that no you remember that all right so if you remember that give me a quick example about that how how do we use that sleeping not necessarily sleeping if you pray if you was praying maghrib if we're playing mm -hmm. maghrib uh huh I just need a small example of how it applies. Small example. Go ahead, I'm listening. Okay, well, we prayed Maghrib and you was in Wudu. We prayed Maghrib and I was in Wudu. And Isha came. And Isha came. And you forgot if you were supposed to be sleeping or not. But you remember, the last thing you remembered was that you, the Wudu was closed. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But you're not 
certain that you broke it or not. So you go with certainty. So you go with certainty. Okay, nice. That's good. Anyone have another example? Or was that not clear? That was clear? Don't say, don't nod your head yes and you really don't know. We don't do that here. One of the things about this class, we don't we don't nod our heads and say we understand if you don't understand. Alhamdulillah. You didn't understand. All right. Does anyone have another example? So you're going to make it clear. The principle in Islam is that certainty is not removed with doubt. Certainty is not removed with doubt. All right. So an example would be right now, you know for a fact that you made wudu for Salat al-Maghrib. But now when you came in the masjid, you sat down, you're reading, and you're thinking, Dad, did I, did I break my wudu? So now you have an issue. The first thing is you know for a fact that you made wudu, but now you have doubt on whether or not you broke your wudu. So then the ruling here is you built on what is firmly established. It was firmly established that you're sure that you made wudu, but you're not sure if you broke your wudu. Then you have wudu. Right? And this is due to the hadith of the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam. When a man was in the salat and he asked him, uh, Do you, he said, Did you hear something or smell something? Because he thought he passed gas or broke wind during the, during the prayer. And he said, Do not leave unless you hear something or smell something. Why did he say hear something or smell something? Because that's certainty. You're certain what you hear and you're certain what you smell, but you're not certain about. Whether you did it or not, you're not sure. All right? But that, that, but that only goes for if you're actually not sure. Like, if I'm, in, if I'm in Salat and I feel it, I know that I passed gas. Like, you know what I'm so then there's no I doubt. Didn't hear it, nor, but I did, Listen, no, okay, I got no, it. he had I doubts. Got you, I got you, I got you. There's a difference. If you had doubts, it's one thing. If you were certain, then it's something else. Nah. So there's another, uh, so what do you mean? He wasn't sure that air came out of his body? Is that what you're asking? So the first thing we mentioned was خروج من السبيل. If a person knows that something came out of his private parts, the two pathways, the front and the back, as you know, if we know for a certainty that something came out, then it breaks your wudu. If you know that for certain, if you don't know for certain and you have you're you're, you're puzzled, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, then you establish what was built on certainty. So as it says here, men taharata. So right now, let's give an example here. We're certain that we made tahara. But we have doubt on whether or not you may, you uh, you broke your wudu. Then you build on what is firmly established. And likewise, the opposite. Right now, you're certain that you lost your wudu, but you're not sure whether you made wudu or not. In this case, you build it based upon what? Based on that, you lost your wudu. Right. The next one. If you are certain Brother smile in the back because you know. Yeah. If you're certain that you made, uh, if you're certain that you broke your wudu and you're certain that you made wudu, what does that look like? I'm going to read and I'll give an example. And what this means is right now, Right now you're certain, okay, right now I'm going to give an example. Right now you pray Salat al-Dhuhr. We pray Salat al-Dhuhr, right? right? Right now after Salat al-Dhuhr, you had to use the bathroom. So you ran to use the bathroom. Later on, when Salat al-Maghrib uh, came in, you know that you made wudu after you used the bathroom, but you also know that you broke wudu again. So now, but you're, so you're certain that you made wudu, right now you pray Salat al-Dhuhr. That's number one. You pray Salat al-Dhuhr. We're certain that we pray Salat al-Dhuhr in Tahara. Okay? Next, after that, you use the bathroom. 
after you finish using the bathroom, maybe you didn't make wudu. But then a little while later, maybe you made wudu. You're not sure what you did. You're not sure whether you made wudu or you didn't make wudu. And now Salatul Asr comes in. So right now we have three certainties. We're certain that we pray Salatul Dhuhr and wudu. We're certain that we went to the bathroom. And we're certain that we made wudu again. But we just don't know whether we made wudu first or we went to the bathroom first and made wudu after. We're confused about that second part. Is that clear? Is the scenario clear? Again, we're certain that we pray Salatul Dhuhr and wudu. No doubt about that. We're certain that after Salatul Dhuhr, I broke my wudu and I made wudu again. But I'm not sure of the order. I'm not sure of the what? The order. So they said, if this is the case, if this happens to a person, then what he should do is go back to the beginning. The beginning was when he first prayed Salatul Dhuhr, he knew he made wudu. Huh? Then he has to take the position opposite of that. The position opposite of that is that he has had to, He needs to make wudu again. In other words, he broke his wudu. Why is that? Because they use the principle. The same principle applies here. Certainty is not removed with doubt. So someone's going to say to me, brother, you just told us that he was certain that he had wudu for Dhuhr. And you just told us that he was certain that he made wudu again. And he was certain that he broke his wudu again. Right? So then how do we know how are we applying this here? Because what you're not certain of is which one came first. Does that make sense? So we're certain that we pray Salatul Dhuhr with wudu. We're certain of that. Right or wrong? Fine. We're certain that I used, we used the bathroom after Salatul Dhuhr, and we're certain that we made wudu again. But what order was it? Did I make wudu first and use the bathroom? Did I use the bathroom and make wudu? Which order? I'm certain that I did both of them, but I'm not sure of the order. So we go back to what was before that. There's no confusion about the order for Salatul Dhuhr. And we take the ruling that is opposite of that. Is that clear? And in Islam, it is also impermissible for a person to touch the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they do not have wudu. There's a big, there's a, a lot of conversation about this from the scholars of the past. And so they mention books of tafsir, books of fiqh, like this, books of ilm. They do not take the same ruling as the Qur'an, even if it has the Qur'an in it, even if they have verses of the Qur'an in it, but it's not the Qur'an. So if a person uh, reads the Qur'an, or if a person touches the Qur'an and they don't have wudu, it's not permissible to touch the book of Allah if you don't have wudu. Now, when you say touch it, the mushaf, you're talking about picking it the up. The whole thing, Sheikh. Don't touch it. If you want to touch it, they say use a hat. Maybe use something like this to pick it up with a tissue and like this. And likewise, yahrum ala muhdith as salat. It is also impermissible for a person to pray and they know they do not have wudu. It is so severe that Imam Abi Hanifa. They even consider it to be disbelief. And some of them say it takes a person outside of Islam if they intentionally pray and know that they don't have wudu. So what happens if a person is leading a salat? There's this, this something that happened, I think it was Imam Hudayfi, sah? طيب. Imam Hudayfi in the Haram in Medina. Big sheikh, right? He was leading a salat in the Haram in Masjid al Nabawi. Big congregation behind him. He was leading the salat and he stopped praying and left the salat to go make wudu. That's a sign of taqwa. That's a sign of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one knew. He could have just continued to pray and, you know, but left. He stopped the salat, left out the salat to go make wudu and come back and someone filled in for him. Okay? Okay. Oh, they waited for him. Bye. No one came to fill him. They, they waited for him. They came back and he finished the salat. Allah Akbar. I thought somebody stepped in. 
So they waited for him to come back to pray. And like I said, this issue of praying without having wudu and you know it, some of the ulama consider this to be kufr, mukhrij, min amillah. Some of them consider this to be disbelief that takes you outside of Islam. Nasallallahu salam wa afiyah. Tayyip. So then, in the next one here, they say, يَحْرَمُ عَلَى muhdith al-tawaf. And they say that also it is impermissible for a person that doesn't have wudu to make tawaf. Even though uh, we had a debate with, uh, you remember that? We had a debate with a brother, one of the students, about this issue of making tawaf and not having wudu. And so one of, our, one of the brothers that we love dearly holds a position that you don't have to have wudu. And there's a lot of early men that hold that position. But then we go back to the origin, and this is a, a principle that we learn, khuruj min khilaf awlad. Why would a person want to risk making tawaf around the Kaaba without having wudu when you could just make wudu? There's no difference of opinion making tawaf around the Kaaba and having wudu, but there is a difference of opinion that you can make tawaf without having wudu. There's a difference of opinion. Stay away from the differences and go with that which is certain here. It's certain that if you make tawaf with wudu, it's permissible. Now, yeah, but that's, 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 that's kind of beautiful about the Ishallah situation because say say you're making wudu like that. I mean, say you're making tawaf and you break your wudu. And you're breaking, well, I don't, I don't need the wudu. Say, he, say he's saying he, I don't, he doesn't need the wudu. To, to, he doesn't have to go sure. to the wudu. You know what I'm saying? So it's upon you. Here's the thing that is most important. And I think sometimes... We may miss the point. This is your religion. I don't own your religion. This is your religion, and you have to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by what you feel is comfortable. In spite of what you hear from the ulama and their different positions, it's upon you to think, is this what Allah wants me to do? Yes or no? That's what you have to ask yourself anytime you do something. Does Allah want me to do this? Will Allah be pleased with me if I did this? You can't just all the time say, you know, I'm, the Sheikh said this, I'm, I feel comfortable to follow this. Next time, oh, I feel comfortable to follow that. Not. You got to fear Allah. You got to think as a Muslim, you have to ask yourself, does Allah want me to do this? Is this going to help me become closer or become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or is it not? Everyone, la taziru wa ziratun wazira ukhra. No one else is going to be responsible for you on your muqiyamah. Every last one of us, we're going to be worrying about our own affair. We're going to be worried. we're not going to be looking for different, you know. Oh, this is a shortcut. Let me try this here. There's another shortcut. Yeah, you know I mean, we're going to take all the rukhas that's around. This is something that's impermissible for a person to do. Just look for all shortcuts all the time. Yeah, you know, shortcut. This is, this is a position here. I'm gonna take that so I don't have to do this. This is our dean. If you know that you're going to get a raise if you go above and beyond. You're going to, you're going to do everything you need to do to go above. Hey, on, we're fighting for Jannah. We're trying to get to paradise, man. We don't have time for games. We don't have time for games. We don't have time to try to, you know, if the majority of the ulama, they mention here, Imam al-Shafi'i mentioned, al-tawafu bil bayt salat, illa inna allaha abaha fihi al-kalam. Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he said, he said that the Prophet ﷺ said, "At-tawafu bil bayt, making tawaf around the house of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is salah, is prayer, except, except that Allah made it permissible to talk. Whereas in regular salah you can't talk, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala made it permissible to talk when a person is in the in the salah. So it's important for everyone to understand." That when we hear these different rulings and all these differences, it's like, oh, wow, this is, you know, it's a difference of opinion. Uh, I can do this. You got to understand, whatever you decide to do, you have to understand that this, you have to believe that this is what Allah wants you to do. Because you have to answer to your Lord. No one else is going to stand for you. You can't say, oh, I heard the brother say in the class. Nah, I'm telling you, look, these are the positions, just so you understand. Because you might hear someone say that, you know, making to off around a cop, you don't need we'll do. Okay, well, you know, you're comfortable with that, you go for what you know. This is why, real quick, Sheikh, this is why we find many of the early men differ on a lot of issues. 
But they're not different because, you know, based on their desires. They're different based on their understanding of text. And all of them are looking to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء Allah says, for indeed, those who truly fear him are the ulama, are the scholars of Al-Islam. So when they're different, they're not just, oh, I just want to be different to him. I want to get a following for this position. And then the fa- nah, this is what they believe. This is what they worship Allah with that. They worship Allah with those positions. A benefit of that, as a student, as a person learning, you learn to respect the khilafat. You learn to respect the differences of opinion from Ahlul Ilm. You can't, here we are, and I, we mentioned this last week, here we are, who are you? You say, um, I don't take that position of the shaykh. That's cool. You take the position of another shaykh. Here's another issue. From the books of Husul, and we spoke about this many times, many, some of this, the Tolet. We live in a city, in a place where a person is, has, is testing, the pro- what's your position on Fulan? This issue here is, is wrong for many Issues of usul. Number one, 99% of the people here, if not all of us here, are muqallidun. What's a muqallid? A person that is not able, pay attention, a muqallid is a person that is not able to extract the rules and ev- the, 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 a person that is not able to extract ayat and a hadith and come with the rulings on issues with themselves. I don't know anyone who has that skill set. If you did have that skill set, you wouldn't be sitting here. You would be sitting here or somewhere else, and I'd be sitting learning from you. We don't have that here. So what does that mean? What does that have to do with it? What does that have to do with anything? A person who, yeah, you know, if a person is a muqallid, even me on issues, I'm a muqallid. Some issues, I don't know. I know there's. Bazi- Two different of positions. Some issues I know the why behind, but other ones I don't know the why. If you don't know the why, then you fall under the ones that follow. Okay? Now, if a person falls under the situation where you follow, it becomes impermissible for you now to force someone to follow who you're following. It's a principle in usul. Anyone who reads through, what's the book uh, that y'all studied? Anyone wants to go look it up? A chapter called Takli. It talks about the imperm- You cannot. Even Sheikh Al Islam Taymiyyah mentions this. If you're a follower, you can't force someone else to follow who you're following. A person can. If you don't know the reason, you can't force someone else to follow a person you're following. You can't do that. If they're following someone else that they trust from a scholar and you're following another scholar who you trust, you can't force someone else to follow the scholar you're following. There's nothing in Islam that supports that. Nothing. Where did this come from? Allahu Alam. I don't know where this came from. But you cannot force another person to follow the person you're following, especially if they're following someone else, because all of you are what? Muqallidun. You're not a mujtahid. You're following another mujtahid. That person's following another mujtahid. You cannot force someone to follow the person you're following. There's nothing that supports that. And anyone doesn't believe me, we have Bahru Muhid. It's another book, Sabu Sul Fiqh. You have uh, Rodu Tanadir. We have Muqtasar uh, Roda Le Tufi. We have Nihayat uh, Sul Le Isnawi Le Isnawi. With the Shah Imam Baydawi. We have numerous books of usul that talks about this stuff. If you have the ability to look it up, it's in uh, Taqlid, Ijtihad, in chapters. It talks about this in great detail. At any event, that was a side. Any questions about this? I have a question. No, I'm It's not about this, but it's a question. If it's not about this, we can wait to after class, inshallah. I said, if it's not about this, can we wait to after class? Yeah. All right, inshallah. You're making me nervous the way you said that. You don't want to come beat me up, do you? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Alhamdulillah. All right. Any question now? As far as that question, um, is that when you said about the Quran, is that the translation also? Shoot. The, transliter- the translation of the Quran is not the Quran. 
Now, um, you love what we do. Look at like small baby. I'm gonna do it and come down to change diaper and something like that. I said the earlier man talk about that. Mm-hmm. Touching the private parts. Oh wow, wow. I would just make wudu again. If you touch your son's private part, I would just make wudu. Even though it was mentioned, uh, I don't. Re- I, when I was covering that, I came across, but I didn't. I don't have it right now. So, inshallah, you? next week we can talk about that. His feet touching the The urine? Yeah. It depends. If the urine from the child is, if the child's breastfeeding or if the child, is the child eating? One year. Breastfeeding and eating. Breastfeeding and eating. So they say you have to wash that. You have to wash it off. But if it's just, um, if the child is breastfeeding, if the son is a boy and he's breastfeeding and he has some urine on you could just sprinkle it. You don't have to wash it because it's not considered nedges. But even though you have to sprinkle it, but it's not considered nedges as if he was eating solid foods. And inshallah, did we cover I think we'll cover that inshallah. Any other questions? Fight. No. Mm. But we already know in Tabligh is not right guidance. No. So we tell them, I'm definitely not going to myself. But I know, I tell the person, the way you follow Tabligh, they mean they know good. Sakhar mm. to all the way down to the baby today, mm. they know good. So I don't have any evidence after, after that. The guy says he's not going to follow. He's the one. Mm. So are you asking me something? Yeah. What so do you can I do? Kind of How can you give him advice? Yes. Does he like you? It's my cousin. It's your cousin. Does he listen to you? Does he respect you? Yes. A lot? If he respects you, then show him where that's wrong. Show him. Don't tell him. Some people, some people want to see stuff. He might love you and respect you, but he might not listen to you because you're not giving him anything. He, he has conviction following Jamaat Tabli. He has conviction doing that. If you, want, if you don't want him to do that, you have to bring him evidence to show that that's not the right way. You have to show him. And that's another thing that's very important. When it comes to advising people and stuff like that, you have to bring your evidence. You can't just, oh, he's an innovator, he's with them, he's an innovator right away. No. There's different, there's different pathways to that. We have something that's khilaf or sunnah, then we have bid'ah. Bid'ah is not khilaf or sunnah. Then we have a person that falls in the bid'ah. Huh? Is that person an innovator right away? La, there's rules to it. Maybe he made a mistake. Maybe he misunderstood a verse in the Quran. Maybe someone told him otherwise. Did you bring him the evidence to show what he was doing was incorrect before you labeled him? La, you didn't. These, these are rules. The early man laid his stuff down. You don't believe me? Your man Mashab, he mentions in his book called Itisam. He talks about bid'ah in great detail. And there are many. Many of them out of the past talk about bid'ah and how to deal with it. And how the salaf used to advise people before they labeled them anything. Stuff is well known. All the students of knowledge and the they know this. It's well known. So my point is, be patient with them. Talk to them. Bring them around some other brothers that may be more knowledgeable than you. Let them talk to them. Inshallah, he'll come around, inshallah. But if, any other questions? But right, next week, inshallah, we're going to cover Bab al Ghusl. How to make a Ghusl. Kalas? Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.